the last generation that will actually hear the Holocaust survivor. There are people today that they say the Holocaust never existed. So that's why it's so important for you to hear our story. Watch the film. Oh, microphone is Are you going to put this right in your pocket? Watch the film carefully. Remember, because I'm going to refer to those things. And then prepare questions as many as you can. So please watch the film.
much for me to tell you that I'm afraid of taking too much time. I come from Czechoslovakia. Can you hear me? Yeah. I come from Czechoslovakia. It was a democratic country such as the United States. In fact, our first president was Tomasz Gat Masaryk. He was a close friend of President Wilson. He was a poet as well. And he wrote a poem which sounds so much better in Czech. Any of you that have any knowledge of a Slav language will know what it means. Svoboda. Svoboda je svoboda. Bez ní nelze žít. Freedom. Freedom is something you cannot live without. You cannot buy it. No one will sell it to you. You have to fight for it. Once you have it, you will, once you achieve it, you must hold on to it, never to let it go. And you children are fortunate to be born in the most wonderful country of the world. You can say whatever you want. You can, you can like the president or dislike him. But this is what happened to us by losing this precious thing, freedom. We were occupied in 1939 by the Germans. Our life has changed drastically. As you saw on the, on the film, Every Jew had to wear the Star of David, sewn on the sleeve and on the back. So wherever you walked, you were seen. Our life has changed. Our freedom was taken away. We could no longer, Jewish children could no longer go to school. You know how some days you would like to stay home, it's cold. But we wanted to go to school, but we no longer could. Any family that could afford to hire a teacher, we got a very meager education. I was 14 years old when we were occupied. They, anybody that had a business taken away from them. Any doctor, lawyer, teacher, any professional could no longer work wherever he was. Any man from the age of 18 to 45, Jewish men, were taken away to slave labor camp. Most of them never returned. Whether he had a small children or a family, that didn't matter. They were taken away. My father had a business. They put in a commissar. They put in a man. And the money from the business, the proceeds, was going to the government. Even we had a farm. They took that away. They took our big house away and they put soldiers in there. There, was a, there came out a law that anybody, any family, that they didn't pay taxes in that region in 1848 
was taken away, was deported, regardless whether he was born in the United States, England, and France, they were deported to Poland. There were we, our town was bordering Poland. This was Czechoslovakia, and about six kilometers further was already a different country, was Poland. The people that could not produce any of these papers were taken to Poland, but most of them never even made it to the border. They were shot and killed before. I, had, I, am a, a, I come from a family of six children. My oldest sister, was living in a small town in Poland. And as long as we were still home, since we had a farm, my mother was able to send some food to her with a peasant. One day, the peasant comes back and he says to my mother, I regret very much I could not deliver to food to Charlotte, but I witnessed her execution. What they did in those towns, they gathered all the Jews, made them go a little bit out of town, made them undress, made them dig their own grave. At that time, they did not have the gas chambers and, and the uh, crematoriums. So what they did, made them undress in order to utilize even the clothes they were wearing. In the brutality, they shot the children first, then the fathers, and at the end, the mothers. So when he came back with the food, he told my mother what he witnessed about my sister. This is my grandniece, and she happens to look just like my sister Charlotte. So it breaks my heart whenever I see her. But we were still home, unlike in other parts of, of Europe. As, how many of you know what a ghetto is? Many of you. Okay. So what they did, they gathered all the Jews and put them in one part of the town, crammed together, living in small in quarters like 15 to 20 families in one house. But we were still fortunate in our part that we were still able to stay home. Until one morning, it was April, it was the first day of the Passover where Jewish people don't eat bread for a whole week. They knocked on the window. It was 6.30 in the morning, two SS men and two Hungarian, because we were, our part was given back to Hungary. They occupied that part uh, before 1918. They said, have a half hour, take all your money, take all your Jews and enough food for a day and go. What did you take after living your entire life? My father was a very religious man. He took his prayer book. My mother didn't want to go. She says, I don't want them to kill me. I'm going to kill myself. I said, Mommy, don't do it. You always have time to die. I took my manicure set. It was my last birthday present, and I took that. And we started marching. We marched four kilometers, which is an hour, to the town. And as they came up, they prepared all the other people to be ready. The women with, with little infants, with little children on their hands. When we came to town, they told us to go up to the cemetery. And my father said, how convenient. They're going to shoot us dead. They don't even have to bring us to the cemetery. That didn't happen. We stayed there without any shelter for a whole week. Within that one week, they said, one person can go home, bring more money, bring more jewels, it's going to save your life. My mother didn't want to go, so I went. When I came home, everything was taken away from us already. I, but I had a beautiful German shepherd, his name was Harry. I said to the woman that worked for us, where is Hari? She says he stopped eating and he died. We still had jewelry and money. I told Dorothy, who worked for us, make a dough, put the money in the dough, bake the bread, and bring it to us to the cemetery. She didn't do it, which is just as good 
hopefully she was able to utilize and save that money for herself. After a week, we were taken to the railroad. This time, we were put into regular trains. We were destined to go to Terezin. Has any of you heard about Theresienstadt? Well, that was a ghetto not far from the capital of Czechoslovakia, of Prague. And that was a model camp. If anybody, the United States or England at that point wasn't at war yet, they, they would say to Hitler, what are you doing to the Jews? He says, nothing special. They are our enemies, and we gather them in a, in a, in a ghetto, and they are, they are just there and waiting. So that when there was an inspection from the Red Cross from the United States, everybody had to put on their Sunday clothes in that ghetto, in that camp, and the children were playing instruments. There was even an opera was conducted with, called Brundibar, and it, they were playing it in, your, in uh, Hartford. If you get to see a very interesting opera. Anyway, we could not get into Terezin, but we were taken to a small town in Hungary. There we were getting about uh, 30 people in a house, but there was shelter, there was a bathroom, and there was a little food every day, a little soup. We were there for six weeks. Ch uh, young girls, as we were, we were watching children, we were cleaning. We were helping in the kitchen. Everybody got a little soup at night, but we were still together with our parents. And after that, one morning, they were told all of us to go to the railroad. But this time, we were put in into the cattle cars, as you saw them. We were put in 60 to 70 people in one cattle car, like Dean's. They gave us one big bowl of uh, water and one empty bowl to use as a bathroom. They closed it with an arm. They started moving. It was the longest four and a half days of my life. There was the first night a man died. What do you do with the body? Put him in a corner. There was no corner. There was so cramped. The children drank the water immediately and they wanted more. So we begged the soldiers when they stopped that they should squirt some water and there was a little opening in the boards to squirt and we pushed the children close to the door. But what was the worst thing? People went berserk. They were screaming and they were hitting one another. The soldier, the SS man said, if that screaming is going to go on, we will take all of you out and shoot you. So what did we have to do? We have to tie their mouth and keep their hands behind them so that they should stop screaming. It, a woman was giving birth. My mother was helping deliver the baby. It was chaotic. Finally, it was the 21st of May. It was my father's birthday. The doors open and they scream, rouse, out. Out. And as you saw, men in striped uniforms are running back and forth. And we asked them, where are we? What is this? And they said, this is hell. Then they were, we were told, line up in row of five. Women separate and men separate. It was my mother, my sister, my aunt, my niece, myself, and my aunt's three little children in front. Then there is the men's row, my father, my brother-in-law, my nephew, my uncle, and another man. The men in the striped uniform are looking at us and saying, 14, Strnads, Tizene, in every language, 14, 14. They see a woman with a baby in her arm. She said, give the baby to your mother. Give the little girl to your grandmother. Don't hold on to the baby when they saw a young woman. To us, they kept saying, then they said in front of the men, 
Are you a doctor? Say you're a doctor. Are you a tailor? They wanted to prepare us, but we were bewildered. We didn't know what do they mean. Then there is a big inscription. It says, Arbeit macht frei. Work will liberate you. We are absolutely bewildered, and we are waiting. Out comes this tall man with the shiny boots and with a rubber stick in his hand. This was Dr. Joseph Mengele. He was to determine who shall live and who shall die. He was called the angel of death. He comes in front of our row. He points to my knees to go to the left, to me to go to the left, and the rest of them are marching on. As I came in front of my father's row, he put his hand on my head as he did every Friday night to bless us. He said, Judy, you will live. And I marched on. As I look back, I see my mother walking and fainting. She had a tendency of fainting. I went in the back of the road and wanted to help my mom up. Mengele saw that. Somebody there disobeyed. He grabbed me and threw me to the left. With this gesture, he literally saved my life. We came into an enormous room, three times the size of this. There are chairs lined up. Behind each chair is a man in the striped uniform with a machine. We were told to get undressed. We are all young girls. The oldest person that that Mengele selected might have been 35, nobody older than that. What he did, he did take out people, not because he wanted us to live, it's because he needed people to work in Germany. So he picked young, healthy people. We were, get, we, to, we were told to get undressed naked. And there are men, SS men, walking around with their German shepherds in their on a leash, we were embarrassed. We sit down on a chair. The men cut our hair completely bold. We were handed a little piece in, of soap in our hand, and we stand in front of a room where it says bath. In our case, it was water. In our parents' case, it was gas. We went through the shower. After we came out of the shower, we were handed a gray dress, as you saw the women. This, the women here had a kerchief. We had nothing. Those big wooden clogs for shoes. And we waited until the entire transport went through. I took one look at my niece, Ida, and I say, you don't look so hot. She says, neither do you, my dear. Completely bold. And we started marching. Birkenau, from Auschwitz to Birkenau, it's muddy. The entire camp is surrounded with barbed wire. If you touch it, you get electrocuted. We walked a long way. We, there is a man from big towers with a machine gun looking at you. There is no way to escape. Nobody can escape. If you touch the wire, you get electrocuted. We came into an enormous room. And these were the coyas. You didn't see that they're like shelves. That's exactly where I wanted. That's where we are, like shelves. Only our, our face sticks out. The one that is on top has some air. And we were put in there, and we have to be quiet. Within minutes, there is an alarm. It's called Blocksperre. You cannot leave the barracks. Not that you could leave without permission ever. Within minutes, there's the most horrific smell of, of burning hair and nails. I asked Olga, who was there for, uh, many years before, what is that terrible smell? She said, these are your parents burning. The transports kept coming in three or four a day. They went through the, the selection and they, they put them into the gas chamber and immediately to the crematorium. 
you are so young. I hate to tell you this horror thing, but you must know because we want you to tell that the world should not forget what happened in this in this era. A little bit about life in Auschwitz. You are being woken up every morning at six in the morning, and you go out to be to be counted. It's called Zählerpel, roll call. You stand in row of five this way, and you are being counted and counted again. Where could she go? So if she died, we have to drag the body out. Or if they went berserk, the, the supervisor, the couple, will have how many went out of their mind and were taken away. Every other day, Mengele comes again to take more inspection. We were pale, so if you look pale, he would take you out and never to be seen again. So what did we do? We pinched our cheeks in order to get some color. Or if you have a pimple, he will take you out. Or if he sees a mother and daughter, he will take one out. Or two sisters, and those are never to be seen again. Are there any twins among you? Oh my God. Many. How fortunate that you were born in this country and in this time. Because they say, step out, you will have a better life. And they did for a while. Just for a while. They were taken, they, they were taken to a hospital where Dr. Mengele did all kinds of experiments on them. However, while these experiments were done on them, they slept in a regular bed. They got better food. They got food. How did we know about it? Sometimes we were taken to go to bring the food to them. But at the end, if we have time, you will see what kind of a terrible experiment they did on them. They changed the color of their eyes. They did all kinds. They, they, there were two sets of twins from my hometown. One set did not, live, did not survive. The other one, but they are mentally and physically impaired. They can't function. They live in California. I visited them. They are not anymore children. They, they are just not normal anymore. So thank God that you were born in this country. Anyway, again, after roll call every morning, we get a little bit of black water. No food all day long. In the evening, we get a pot of soup, just thickened with some bran. We have no spoon. So you take a sip, the next one gets one sip, and you are being watched very carefully. We get a little piece of bread once a week, four inches square, very thin. Would you, you could eat it up in a minute because you're so hungry, but you hold on to it just in case the next day there is no food. Occasionally we are taking to work, which is great. We are taking to the railroad as the new transports are coming in from France, from from uh, Germany, from Austria, and you do selection. If you find any money, you have to, you are being watched very carefully. You have to assort it, shoes, skirts, blouses. But if you find a morsel of food, you, if you can put it in your mouth without SS men or SS women seeing you, you are very happy about it. We were in Auschwitz for six weeks. Our group, we were 1,400 in that one barrack. The, the hygiene is perfect. We, we are being taken to take a shower once a week, but with big, big trepidation, are we going into the place where the water will come down or where the gas? Because if he picked too many people and couldn't place them to work, they never came back to the barrack after the shower. Uh, could I just get a tissue? I I have one here, but somewhere. Okay, no, I think I have. I I got it. Thank you. Anyway, after six weeks, we were taken. Our we came blanket. 
wonderful a blanket, what a, what a treasure. We were not taken back to the barracks anymore, we were taken to the railroad in a regular train and we were taken to West Germany to a town called Gelsenkirchen. We lived in tents, we worked 24 hours, two shifts, day shift and night shift. We were all young girls, a little bit older than you or about the same age. And there, however, we got already a little better food. We got a bowl, we had our own spoon, and we got a bowl of soup every night after we came home from work. We got a piece of bread every other day, but we were out of Auschwitz. The fear that you are going to be killed any day, we were out of it. Our shoes had broken already, those wooden shoes. If we found some newspaper, we wrapped it around our feet. But again, even with the hard work, we were happy to be out. Many of us could not work anymore. When you cannot work or you get sick, you are being taken away, never to be seen again. There were bombs that happened in Gelsenkirchen. A bomb came down and 30 of our girls were killed that one night from my, all from my group. After many months in Gelsenkirchen, we were told to go on to the next city, that was Essen. There we worked in an ammunition factory. Now when you come home, your mommy's coffee maker is made by Krupp. But then they did ammunition for the, for the war. There again, at this point, it was bitter cold, it was snow. We walked to work and I remember the Germans saying, these are these sind Leute von einem Hirnanstalt. These are people from an insane asylum. No hair, a gray dress, and, and an SS man and woman on each side watching us. How I wanted to tell them, no, we are, vic we are victims of your regime. We are not from an insane asylum. But you don't talk, because if you do, you, you get beaten up and taken out never to be seen again. After what happened to me in Essen, in the factory, in that ammunition, I put in a piece of iron in the oven, and when it gets hot to take it out, it fell on my wrist and it broke. If you can't anymore, you are being sent away. It was full, it swole up, we came to camp, and the following day there was a transport of women. There were a few pregnant women, a few very sick women, girls, that they were going to be taken away. I said goodbye to all my friends and to my niece, and I'm ready in terrible pain. Middle of the night, somebody hits me on the shoulder. It's Essence woman, Erika. She says, come to Kleine, come little one. She called me little one. And I, she took me to the hospital, and they put yes. Being uh, taken to Auschwitz tomorrow, what do I need a cast? She says, don't ask questions. On the way home from the hospital, she stopped off at the factory, and she talked to the Mr. who is the foreman. She says, Mr. Miller, I need this girl. She speaks many if she is taken away, your work is not going to be done. Because if they need it, let's say, in, in Hungarian and Russian and Polish and Czech, whatever language, all the languages I spoke, uh, I tell them what to do. He gave her a letter. When she came back to the camp, she handed it over to the head of the uh, SS, and I was spared. Again, I was spared. One of my first cousins was taken, she could no longer work, she was taken with that transport again. We worked there again many weeks. The case, I had to go to work, but what? we were ridden with lies. We left office, we did not have a shower or a change of clothes. We were full of lies, and the lies crawled into the case. If I found a broken umbrella to scratch it, 
took it off. As you will see, this is what we just eaten in bone. So it was just the skin was all eaten up by the lice. Anyway, after many months, we were told to go to march. And this it was literally the death march because we were so emaciated and so skinny, we could no longer walk. What was the worst part? If there was a mother and daughter or two sisters walk, we had to drag the one that could still walk that we should save her life. She did not want to leave her, her sister or mother there. And we walked. It took about three and a half weeks to reach our destiny. Out of the amount of girls that we left Essen, only half of us arrived alive in Bergen-Belsen. The camp of Bergen-Belsen. If anybody survived Bergen-Belsen, we live forever. Then we walked into the camp. There was no hygiene. Ever. Mountains and mountains of dead bodies. You actually walked over dead bodies. Hygiene, none. There was an epidemic of flak ty typhoid. Your body is covered in spots with very high fever. We came in there. We, could, we just had a big building to sit on the floor. Hardly any food, every other day a bit of soup. It was chaotic. We were begging God to let us go already. We could not endure the hardship. My niece is still completely joined us already. And she said, Judy, if I could only have one more more slow, don't mind dying. The SS women announced, if anybody is willing, to go and carry those bodies into a mare's grave, they will earn a bowl of soup. I got another girl from my hometown, and I say, could you come? And the bodies are so, they are all bloated. The, the arms are, are breaking. We carried and we worked all day long. At the end of the day, we got a bowl of soup. And my Ida, we shared it, the three of us. And suddenly she is gone. I said, where is Ida? She just didn't want me to see her die. We struggled like that. There were days where we, did, we didn't see any SS men. They, were, they knew that the war is coming to an end and they were losing. So they went away. So what did we do? We went to the places where, they kept, where the Germans kept their food, hoping that we can steal some. But we didn't know that there were uh, German civilians and they were shooting at us. Two of my distant cousins were killed the last day before liberation. And then one morning, it was a beautiful sunny morning, we see soldiers in a different uniform. These were the British. They said, you are free. We could not believe it. Are you sure? I spoke English because I, I learned English before. He said, are you sure you're not disguised? No. Free. What do we do with our life? We know we have no more parents. We don't know whether we have any siblings. You are free, but where? What do you do? They gave us a choice. You can stay in displaced camps in Germany. You can go back to your country of origin, or you can go to Sweden. The Swedish count, count uh, uh, Folke Bernadotte, and he invited thousands of survivors to go to Sweden. I chose to go to Sweden. My niece chose to go back. Oh, yes. I, ha I too had typhoid, uh, high fever. After four weeks after the liberation, I wake up in a hospital. And they converted churches and uh, schools to hospitals. And when I woke up, my niece was in the same room alive. What a wonderful feeling. But at least I have my niece alive. So she chose to go back to Czechoslovakia. 
because he was hoping to, to find her brother. Unfortunately, he was killed two days before liberation, stealing some potatoes from a farmer. And, uh, but I chose to go to Sweden. I learned a new language and I learned my profession in design. And uh, I, after uh, two years in Sweden, I was able to come to the United States. And nobody appreciates and loves this country of ours as we survivors do. Because, because we know what it means to be free. And this is the most wonderful country as far as we are concerned on the world. And what we, those long-term organizations, we have 130 members in this area. Only three of us can speak. And those that go, we want you children because you are the future. We know that you will create a better world. And we want you to remember, tell it to your children, tell it to your grandchildren what you heard, because there are those that say it didn't happen. And if you see any injustice in your school, in your church, in your playground, stand up for it. Don't say that it doesn't concern you, because if more people would have done that, perhaps so many million, six million Jews, 20 million other nationalities died in this horrible time. So you have a big job ahead of you to create a better world. And I hope that you have good questions for us. I'll need some because I don't hear so well. I beg your pardon? Do you remember any of the names of who wrote you while you were in Auschwitz? Oh, yes. Those, the, any of my friends, you mean? Uh, yes. Uh, your name Jack. We did not know names. Actually, we didn't know by names. Only, we, you see, most happened, and many of the transports as they came in, many of them got a tattoo. That was, that was a, a plus because they said that uh, those people with the tattoo, they, they, when, as they came in, they were asked, what name are you, what is your name, and what country is your origin? Supposedly, the World Red Cross got those. When we came in, they, didn't, they did not give us a tattoo. Not that he didn't kill all of them. He might have killed some with the number as well. But it was a bit, a bit of a security to have the number. But it was like you are branded. How many of your family members survived? Only my niece, Ida, and me, and my brother was caught. He was first in a slave labor camp. After two years, he was caught by the Russians, and he was sent to Siberia. So only three of us from them survived. Well, let me also, while you are thinking of more questions, there were many non-Jewish families that had they been caught hiding Jewish people, they would have been killed in their family as well. So they did a terrific uh, good deed to save people. Many of, them were, many of them were taken and put into jail if they were caught. So there were many good people that saved Jewish people, predominantly in Poland. Um, Why? Because he want, what he really he wanted to have that uh, German women more birth to, to uh, twins and triplets because he wanted more people, and he on them it was terrible. If you could show the last portion of it, you will see what kind of horrible horrible experiments he did on them. A big pun? Yeah, then, no, it goes, it's after that. 
as way of uh, Oh yes, when he, uh, after he selected, when he was selecting the men, he would ask them, what is your profession? You said a tailor, he needed a tailor so he saved his life. He also, he want, are you a musician? Then the, there was a band that they were playing classical music. He picked only people that he needed. Oh yes. Oh, when uh, when the Allies came, uh, in in fact, General Eisenhower said to his staff, "Take all the pictures you can, because there will be people that they will say it never happened." So they, they take, took all the pictures. This was the best model. In the very, the very hard factory world, but oh yes, if you have a chance, and I suggested uh, to Mrs. Wagner, Miss Miss Wagner, to read the book The Sunflower, it is a very, very interesting book to see what you can do when he. When he got the Hitler Jugend, he picked young, young students and they, he gave them a uniform and they were so proud of it to be part of the Hitler Jugend. And this is the liberation. That's what we look like. Oh my God. Are there any more questions you can ask? Did you go all the time? I want to tell you, it was very difficult to run away. Some of the people there, they were shot in prison. There were a few people that were that were able to hide and uh, and uh, stay out through the war. If they had enough money, for money they could help them. Not that they wanted the money, but it helped you them buy food and other things. Well, in 2010, I went back to Auschwitz with 80 students and I showed them all the clips. Um, this is actually in Auschwitz. They gathered, he, he utilized everything, the hair that they cut off, they utilized that too, for everything. Oh, may the words of my mouth meditation of my If you have a chance to ever see John Schindler's play, this was very good. That was, he was a, uh, a German officer and he gathered a whole group of people and he said to them to keep the families together. Okay, now this is what he did with the twins. You see all the uh, uh, Do I have a few more minutes? A little? No. Two minutes. Okay, a little more joyful thing. After we were liberated in Bergen-Belsen, one of the young women found her, her fiancé. So she says, I want to get married, but I want to have a white dress. White dress in, in Bergen-Belsen, give me a break. So there was a British soldier. He had a parachute, a white parachute. 
he says, okay, you can have it. So they got somewhere a scissors and a needle and some white thread, and one of the girls were able to cut a dress, and she got married in a white dress. Of course, she was a little bit broader. Then the next girl wanted to get married, found her fiancé too, so they had to take it in. So there was some little joy in Bergen-Belsen after liberation. Thank you so much for listening. And have a wonderful life. Molly, go ahead. Did anyone ever escape? A few of them did, very few and far in between. They were the partisans, they lived in the woods and some of them, but very few and far in between. No. Did we ever see Hitler? No, 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 nobody ever saw him. But he had very good emissaries that did their job very Wonderful. Well, of all the things, every one of you will get a little, just a little card. And one of you might get my story there. Wouldn't that be something? My friend was able, she, she happened to get my story, but you get a story of every survivor. Be prepared for an for a unbelievable, then this year they're going to go? You are, it's not a trip, but it is very educational. So thank you again for inviting me. Oh, you yeah. have. What what happened to me? It is it never leaves you, my dear. It never never leaves you. There are days that you say, "Oh my God, why am I complaining? I was so hungry all the time. How can I not from from morning to night? If you skip lunch, terrific deal. You never forget it. And so you appreciate your life." Thank you. Have a wonderful life. Thank you.